Hey, welcome. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor David Kaplan from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Uh, David did his undergrad at Cornell, his PhD at uh, Caltech, uh, working with Sri Kulkarni, um, and then did a postdoc at MIT and a Hubble Fellowship at Santa Barbara. And then he's been um, faculty at University of Wisconsin since 20, sorry, 2010? 2010. Yeah. 2010. Um, he's an expert on um, radio and time variability, and he served on the uh, Decadal Review for Ground-Based Astronomy um, this last, Astro 2020. So it's my pleasure to have him visit um, and to see his talk on, on the transient universe in the radio. Let's welcome our speaker. Great, thank you very much. It's nice to be here. Um, lovely day you're all having here, although I think it might be snowing back where I live, so this is still pretty pleasant. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, what we've been doing with the uh, Australian Square Kilometer Array Pathfinder ASCAP to explore the radio time domain. Uh, now, I know that you know, there are a number of people here who do their own uh, radio observations of the sky. Uh, just to be clear, when I talk about radio wavelengths, I talk about radio wavelengths that you can see. You know, we talk about wavelengths of you know, 10 centimeters all the way up to a few meters. These millimeter things, they make me uncomfortable. So I'm going to talk about longer wavelength transients, uh, which isn't to uh, you know, slight any of the really exciting work going on at shorter wavelengths. Uh, and I think we talk, I talked with some students earlier. I think there are some interesting synergies that we can uh, look at going forward. So the Australian Square Kilometer Array Pathfinder, ASCAP, is located at the Inyarimana Ilgaribundara, our Murchison Radio Astronomy Observatory site in Western Australia. And we want to acknowledge the Wajirayamaji people as the traditional owners of the site. It's a really fantastic site. It's a really amazing place to visit. Again, I know many people here work with facilities at your own remote sites, South Pole, Atacama. This has its own challenges to get there. Uh, actually, one of the biggest challenges is driving. They have these you know, giant semi trucks with two or three trailers on dirt roads, and they are somewhat dangerous. So you know, driving and dehydration are actually more of a challenge than all of the crazy Australian critters. Although I did encounter when I went to the site, uh, I was you know, reaching under a cabinet to try to unscrew some coax lines, felt a little bit of spider web, looked underneath, and there was a black widow waiting for me under there. So you do get you know, everything at this facility. So why do we under want to understand the radio time domain? Of course, at high energies, X-ray and gamma ray wavelengths, the time domain has been fruitful for decades. Cosmological gamma ray bursts, X-ray binaries, soft gamma ray repeaters, there's a whole range of really exciting phenomenology. Now, the 2010s were, some could say, the decade of surveys, things like the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, PanStars, and many others, really gave us a fantastic, if static, view of the universe at optical wavelengths. Since those completed, there's also been a proliferation of optical time domain surveys, each fulfilling its own little niche in an ecosystem, things like Atlas, PTF and now ZTF, Assassin, Darsh Energy Survey, and then of course Kepler Tess and Gaia. Each of these has really unlocked a new regime in terms of the types and nature of the transients that we're able to study. And over the next decade, we'll be taking this even further with the Vera Rubin Observatory Legacy Survey of Space and Time that again, many of you in this room are involved in. And then, of course, there's going to be the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope and things like that. We want to also expand further in wavelength, both into the ultraviolet with facilities like Ultrasat and into the infrared with facilities like Winter and Dreams. And of course, the time domain was called out as a priority area by both the 2010 and now the 2020 Astronomy Decadal Survey. 
But what about radio wavelengths? And again, I'm going to concentrate here on centimeter wave radio wavelengths. We sort of want to answer the question, what goes bump in the night? But because we're observing at radio wavelengths, we can also say, what goes bump during the daytime, too? What might cause radio variability that we can probe? Well, explosions, things like supernovae, gamma ray bursts, things that have been extensively studied at optical wavelengths. But then there are other things that you might see uniquely at radio wavelengths. For instance, orphan afterglows, where a gamma ray burst goes off, but you're not looking down the barrel of the jet, the jet's somewhat off to the side, you might only be able to see that at radio wavelengths. Or neutron star mergers. Again, some of these might go off during the day. You might miss them in the optical, but you could see them at radio wavelengths. We're also very affected by propagation through the ionized interstellar medium. So scintillation, extreme scattering events can tell us about the nature of gas in our galaxy. Accretion, again, just like optical and high energy wavelengths, accreting phenomena, neutron stars, black holes, quasars, X-ray binaries, tidal disruption events, all give rise to variability at radio wavelengths. And then there are magnetospheres. Everything from ultra-magnetized magnetars, flare stars, planetary variability even, things like Jupiter. Jupiter around another star, could we be able to find that? All of those sorts of things can have variable or transient emission at radio wavelengths. And then finally, there are the unknowns, the things that we don't really know about, but radio will be the way to discover them, not just study them. Now, of course, the radio time domain has been studied for decades. Jocelyn Bell was looking at radio scintillation, a propagation effect, when she discovered pulsars to probe the strong magnetospheres. But often this was done with single dish radio telescopes like the Parkes telescope here, which means that you have poor resolution and therefore poor sensitivity due to a confusion limit. We now, of course, also have really fantastically capable interferometers like the very large array shown here, but they have modest fields of view. So if you know where to look, you could do really sensitive studies, but if you don't know where to look, you're going to be limited. For that reason, many time domain studies so far have been limited by targeted follow-up of transients identified elsewhere. Things like gamma ray burst afterglows, relativistic supernovae, magnetars, flaring brown dwarfs, tidal disruption events. All of these have been studied at radio wavelengths, but primarily identified elsewhere. Sorry, X-ray binaries as well, extreme scattering events. These are sort of lensing things that happen in the interstellar medium, where all of a sudden a quasar will brighten dramatically for a few days or weeks and then fade away. And then there are other things that we don't really know about. This is a particularly interesting source called the Galactic Center Radio Transient. It seemed to repeat every 77 minutes and show a mission that lasted about 10 minutes, but then it will just disappear for months or years at a time. Nobody really knows what it is. Is it something that was only identified as a galactic center transient because that's where they were looking? Or is it actually related to something along the line of sight to the galactic center? So what we want to do is move to systematic explorations of the radio sky. So this is the Hubble Extreme Deep Field in that little square compared to you know, a one degree digitized sky survey image and then the full moon. This is the typical resolution of a large single dish radio telescope. So, you know, if you're trying to study individual sources with that, it's going to smear them all. You will be able to see what's going on. So, okay, then you go to an interferometer, 
And your field of view is OK, but it's still smaller than the full moon. So if you want to make a map of large areas of the sky, it's going to take a lot of time. Of course, in the optical domain, they've been solving this problem over the last decade with bigger and bigger CCD arrays. So of course, this is a plot I'm sure many of you are very familiar with, uh, going all the way uh, up to you know, LSST, ZTF, dark energy camera. These giant fields of view enable you to cover swaths of the sky with great sensitivity and great speed and are enabling fantastic discoveries. But you know, here's our full moon again. And so if we take that field of view from the previous slide, it just doesn't compare with these optical time domain facilities. Instead, we need a survey telescope. We want a radio telescope to quickly cover a large area of the sky with good sensitivity, discover new explosive events, find fast radio bursts, map the hydrogen in our galaxy and in other galaxies, survey for galaxies and quasars, and establish number counts over time and across space. Especially, we want to understand the time domain properties. You could try to define a figure of merit to optimize for your surveys. This is my only equation. So you want high collecting area. You want a sensitive telescope. You want a large field of view. You want a long survey with many individual observations. If you make that number as large as possible, that will be a good survey telescope. So that is what we're trying to do with ASCAP. So far, we've had static surveys of the sky. With the VLA, we had the NRAO VLA Sky Survey and FIRST. This is changing somewhat with the VLA Sky Survey. And even though that's discovered some really interesting sources, it's still only three epochs. Only three passes over the entire sky, separated by a few years. What we really want to be able to do is to study the sky more quickly on a wider range of timescales. And this is all paving the way for the square kilometer array. So that's where we come to ASCAP. ASCAP has 36 dishes, each of which is 12 meters in diameter, spread over about six kilometers in the Western Australian desert. Now, what makes these telescopes special is that rather than a single receiver mounted at prime focus, they each have a phased array feed. So this is the feed here. Might be a little hard to see, but there are a bunch of little conducting elements there. And what you can do is you can individually adjust the phases and amplitudes of those elements. And in software, use this to form many individual beams on the sky. And you have some freedom about how to arrange them, how to pack them exactly what frequencies they cover and stuff like that. So with this phase array feed receiver, you can make 30 individual beams on the sky. Generally, you put them in sort of a, a close packed arrangement so that we get a pretty uniform sensitivity over a 30 square degree field of view, but with a resolution of 10 to 15 arc seconds, depending on frequency. So we can combine the very wide field of view of a small single dish telescope, multiply it by 30, and then get the resolution of an interferometer. So ASCAP can be used to make really nice images like this. This is hydrogen gas in the Large Magellanic Cloud. Quickly survey large areas of the sky. And then because it's a radio interferometer, for every pixel, we can get the spectrum. Depends a little on signal to noise, but in principle, if there's an emission line there, if there's an absorption line there, you can determine that for every pixel independently. So here's a map of the velocities across some of the large Magellanic Cloud. 
plus for every pixel, you also get the polarization. So you get multi-dimensional information across a wide area of the sky very quickly. So coming back to our plot here, this is the field of view of ASCAP. So it's enabling us to do a new kind of survey. Now ASCAP was defined as a survey telescope. So it's not a telescope that has a call for proposals every six months where you say, okay, I want to look at that galaxy and that galaxy and that star over there. Instead, it's primarily driven by a series of survey science projects, each of which has its own little scientific niche. So EMU is a very large continuum survey, basically surveying the whole sky at great depth. So you know, if you like quasars, if you like star-forming galaxies, EMU is a survey for you. Wallaby is a large all-sky H1 spectral line survey. There are also surveys to look at the galaxy in both H1 and OH lines. Uh, there is the craft survey, which is doing fast transients, which is finding and localizing large numbers of fast radio bursts. And then there is the vast survey, which looks at relatively slow transients, so transients where we need to make images to find them. And I am one of the co-PIs of VAST, together with Tara Murphy at the University of Sydney. Now, we've been working on defining, defining and, and getting VAST up and running for about the last 10 years. Yeah. Uh, you should use this thing. Uh, so for the FAST survey that you mentioned was looking at fast radio bursts, is it possible to combine ASCAP data with something like CHIME if you are doing contemporaneous observations in the same source? Uh, that would be nice. They are in different hemispheres. And CHIME, uh, because it's fixed cylinders, really can't point south of the equator. Well, not CHIME, but the center. Right, yeah. OK, yeah, yeah I mean, yeah, and, and there's also a difference in longitude. So there's, but you can, in principle, improve resolution by combining with a separate facility. Yeah, yeah. I mean, basically, you know, you're talking about like outriggers or something like that. Yeah, uh, you, you could. Um, I think that's actually not the direction they're going. There is a, a, a new product under development called Craco, uh, C R A C O, um, that I think is coming up with new digital hardware to sort of do real time FRBs on a wider range of data. Uh, the way they were doing FRBs previously with Craft was they would often discover them in incoherent with some data and then. Uh, analyze the coherent data to localize them. I may have that slightly wrong. So I, I don't, I'm not actually part of the project, but I think Krakow will be able, basically be coherent FRB detection and localization. So along with VAST, there are a number of not competitor projects, but maybe complementary projects, each doing their own thing. So we are using ASCAP. As I'll show you, we have between 20 and 100 epochs covering the sky over the course of five years. We sample as frequently as every two weeks, or at most every few months, covering about 10,000 square degrees, so about a quarter of the sky in total, although we also have access to all of the data from ASCAP. So when EMU is doing their survey for you know, high redshift quasars, we can look for transients there too. So, uh, they are, yeah, they're not the same. Everything they do, we get to look at. Everything we do, they don't get to look at because it's not useful for them. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I mean, the, the data do become public, actually, so they could, but we're looking at it in real time. Yeah, okay. So, but is the 10,000 square degrees exactly the same by definition? No, the 10,000 square degrees is dedicated for VAST. Okay. EMU is doing 30 odd thousand square degrees, okay. uh, so is Wallaby. And one more quick follow-up question. Since you mentioned real time, are you actually putting out alerts in real time? If you we find plan it? to. OK. So, uh, I so something like LSSD could, in principle, if yes. you found something, just go hammer it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I, I could talk later. I didn't include, I have the slides here, but they're not, probably won't get to them about some of our architecture and things like that. Um, a lot of the synchrotron sources evolve too slowly to necessarily be of great interest. But we do have a sort of a quasi real time back end to identify faster things. 
And the plan is to connect that up to you know, a, a circular distribution. Where circular, you know, a, a message passing, a, a me, yes, a message passing format of your choice. Um, so, you know, a complementary thing is the VLA Sky Survey, which again is doing really great work with the VLA, but that's only three epochs total over about three or four years. Uh, higher frequency as well, so somewhat different science. It's covering a wide area and it's pretty deep, but you don't get a lot of the shorter time scales or statistics on how often things repeat. At the other end of the spectrum, Meerkat is a fantastic telescope. They're not doing, for the most part, wide, unbiased surveys. What they are doing is things like looking at an X-ray binary every couple of weeks, but then also identifying all of the other sources in that field of view that might be doing interesting things. So it's you know, a lot of deep, targeted, galactic fields, but not really getting a wide, unbiased survey. So I think these three surveys all actually work well together. They're each probing different axes in this multi-dimensional parameter space. And then, of course, there are facilities at longer wavelengths. I worked on the Murchison Wide Field Array. There's also LOFAR and the LWA. And then, of course, shorter wavelengths, like many people here, SBT, ACT, Simons Observatory, et cetera. So VAST, in particular, survey goals are to identify the origin and nature of extreme scattering events to detect and monitor orphan gamma ray burst afterglows, to conduct an unbiased survey of radio supernovae, to discover flaring magnetars, pulsars, and rotating radio transients, to detect and monitor flare stars and X-ray binaries, and to identify previously unknown classes of objects. ASCAP was commissioned about five years ago. We had two to three years of pilot survey observations, 2019 to 2021, where we had a limited series of observations to try to you know, shake out our software and our observing and data reduction strategies. So we divided the sky into a number of regions, you know, equatorial regions that were good for, say, overlap with things like Sloan, extragalactic regions that were good for overlap with things like the Dark Energy Survey, Galactic Center, and then the large and small Magellanic Clouds. We have observed them repeatedly, you know, between six and 15 times over the course of two years. We did a number of different searches on this. We would, you know, cross-correlate with all of your favorite sources of choice, whether it's, say, stars from Gaia, gamma ray bursts, supernovae, classical novae, all those sorts of things. And then we would also just do unbiased searches where we would, uh, sorry. Yes, where we would just, you know, assemble statistics on every source in our data set and say, okay, how much are they varying? How well fit are they by a constant model? And look for all the outliers. And so we found that in this region of parameter space was the best way to identify all the most interesting sources. Most of those turn out to be AGN, but not all of them. So through this early science, this pilot science phase, we came up with a number of papers. I'm not going to have time to go into all of these here, but everything from unbiased samples of radio stars to new pulsars, galactic center, to searches for supernovae and gamma ray bursts. I'll talk about a few of them. So the first one that I'm going to talk about for a couple of minutes is a possible coronal mass ejection from the star Proxima Centauri. And what we're really getting at here is extrasolar space weather. M-dwarfs are the most common type of star in the galaxy. M-dwarfs have planets. M-dwarfs have planets in the habitable zone. Unfortunately, though, this habitable zone is very close in to the star which means if the star does something unusual, like flare or shoot out a bunch of plasma, it can dramatically affect any life on that planet. So whether or not life is able to emerge in this habitable zone could be influenced by how these, sort, these stars behave in terms of their space weather. 
Now, we know that M dwarf stars, especially the younger ones, flare a lot. But by flare here, I just mean we see a, a brief increase in the radio flux or in the optical flux. That in itself may not be enough to cause space weather. What we really want to know is, are these stars shooting out blobs of plasma, like the things that were giving rise to really nice northern lights over the UK in the last week? And would those be affecting any planets around them? Are there large increases in plasma and ionizing radiation to go along with these, say, optical flares that TESS and Kepler are seeing? So to study this, we chose to focus in this pilot survey on Proxima Centauri. This is the closest star to the sun. It's an M dwarf, which is known to flare at radio and optical wavelengths. And there's three planets, at least, including Proxima Centauri b, which is in the habitable zone. And so Andrew Zick, shown here, together with Meredith McGregor and others, put together a multi-telescope observing campaign, all the way from radio wavelengths, multiple optical facilities, tests, and also higher energy facilities, too. And what we found at radio wavelengths turned out to be interesting. We found, coincident with a bright optical flare, a very bright radio flare. Now, the sun has space weather. The sun emits various types of flares in optical and radio light. These are categorized, unless you're a solar astronomer, these names may ne mean nothing to you. But what we were able to do was to categorize this particular flare as the same as a solar type 4 event. And when the sun emits one of these type 4 flares, you see the radio and optical flare, and it's just about always followed by a coronal mass ejection. So even though we're not living in the system, we can tell that Proxima Centauri did emit a blob of plasma together with this optical flare. So this is you know, perhaps the first identification of a coronal mass ejection in a star other than our sun. But the good news is, that these types of flares are actually pretty rare. So the rate of flares like this from Proxima Centauri that are associated with coronal mass ejections, not all of the flares, all, there are a lot of flares overall, but most of them are probably not all that harmful to any living organisms. So the rate of events that we see here suggests that flares associated with CMEs are not as bad as previously thought, and therefore this space weather may not be as damaging as some of the initial predictions expected. So now, jumping topics entirely, I'm going to talk about identification of a long scintillating filament in the Milky Way. This actually started with a different project, though, which was ASCAP follow-up of gravitational wave transients. As many of you know here, LIGO puts out alerts when it finds things. But it will sort of say, you know, there was some gravitational waves coming from vaguely over there. We can't tell you exactly where it came from. And large field of view optical telescopes try to pin this down. We can do the same thing in radio wavelengths. And it turns out that the fields of view of ASCAP is comparable to the location uncertainties for well-localized gravitational wave events. So here is an event that, you know, that's the phone number there. It may be familiar to some of you, like Geltum, 1908-14. This was, when it was announced, it was a neutron star black hole merger. Probably didn't emit any optical radiation. Probably the neutron star was just swallowed. But at the time, we didn't really know that for certain. So we followed it up with ASCAP. And the gravitational wave error region, these contours here, actually were well matched to the ASCAP field of view. So we did a number of deep pointings to see, did anything new arise? Now, if you do this with the dark energy survey, with the dark energy camera, you'll find you know, one field of view, dozens of supernovae over the course of a year. The radio sky is actually, thankfully, a little bit more boring. We don't find nearly as many random, unrelated events. So we were able to drill down even further. And this was work led by Dougal Doby. 
So we were able to see, OK, it didn't look like there was anything associated with this gravitational wave merger. We did actually find an interesting transient that Dougal's been following up separately. That's a different paper, though. But what we found was that there were a number of quasars that really stood out for their variability. They were you know, bright, well-defined radio sources, but they would wiggle up and down over the time scale of hours by you know, factors of two or three or four in a really unusual way. Now, again, things like this have been identified in the past as so-called extreme scattering events, basically where you have a, some plasma, the radio waves are passing through that plasma and cause some sort of lensing. What was interesting here was that we were able to identify so many of these all at the same time. And then the student, Yuan Ming Wang, was able to show that they all lined up on the sky. All of these sources lined up in this single long line. And it wasn't just a coincidence. You know, we tested for all that. So what we think is happening here is that all these things are coming from quasars being lensed at the same time by a single filament of gas, several degrees long, but only a couple of arc minutes wide. We don't know for certain, but our best hypothesis here is that this might be a tidally disrupted gas stream, sort of trailed out. You have a star passing by, say, a cloud of hydrogen gas. It will pull gas along behind it in a tail. This gas will be, cloud, will be uh, relatively dense and cold. We think that it has to be many parsecs wide. Not very lot, not a lot of mass, 10 to the minus 8 solar masses. Not very dense, but enough to give rise to this fluctuation. And so it's pulled out of this cold cloud, and then once it's out in the middle of space, it can get ionized by cosmic rays, and then give rise to this weird scintillation phenomenon. So what we're using here is we're using the radio sky as a backlight to study turbulence in the Milky Way galaxy. This was just sort of an accidental discovery that Yuan Ming made. But we're developing new ways to find events like this routinely to try to understand how much this is happening and to see how this contributes to the sort of turbulence budget of the Milky Way. Another thing that we've been doing is serendipitous discoveries of pulsars. So I grew up on pulsars. I really like them. The normal way we find pulsars is we get a large single dish telescope, again, like Parks here. We point at the sky. We record the data at very high time and frequency resolution. We do a bunch of FFTs, try to identify periodic signals, and we find pulsars. This is being done by you know, many telescopes around the world, Arecibo until it collapsed, Parks, Green Bank. But one of the problems here is that you come up with many, 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 many candidates. And it's hard to tell which of them are real. So for instance, which of these is a real pulsar? That, 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 or that. And you know, we train our undergrads to sift through these data sets look at the characteristics of known pulsars. They get pretty good at it. But, and of course, you could also train an AI system to do the same. But what you're really doing there is finding pulsars that look like the pulsars you already know about. Are there other ways to find pulsars, especially more unusual ones, that don't rely on the patterns that we've been exploiting for the last 50 years? Can we find out new kinds of pulsars by looking in new ways? Well, what else makes pulsars unique? Honestly, I don't remember. <laughs> I could probably look it up, but I don't remember. My guess is, I bet, I think this is a real one and that one, but I'm not sure. <laughs> so pulsars have steep radio spectra. And in fact, 
This was used in the past to discover the first millisecond pulsar. It was known as a deep spectrum radio source before they saw pulsations. We've been trying to do this for decades since as we've been getting more and more radio surveys. It turns out, though, it's tough because there are a whole lot more AGN out there than there are pulsars. You can also use association of pulsars with high energy X ray or gamma ray sources to filter down the list of radio objects that might be interesting. As far as Dale Frail has been doing this uh, over the past few years. Pulsars are small enough that they twinkle at radio wavelengths, so you can look for variable sources, sort of like those scintillating quasars I showed you before, and focus in on those. Or what I'm going to exploit today is the fact that they have strong magnetic fields, so the radio emission is polarized. What we want to be able to do is combine all of these and identify the oddballs in our radio surveys to identify new pulsars, especially the pulsars that were missed by the traditional surveys. So here is a region of the Milky Way galaxy. This is actually the field of view that we were looking at to study Proxima Centauri. So Proxima Centauri is right in the middle. You can see you know, a bunch of supernova remnants, you know, very, very bright sources that lead to a lot of rippling side lobes that weren't completely removed. Just you know, general synchrotron background from the Milky Way. Huge, noisy image. Which one of these is a pulsar? You know, if I didn't have a box around it, you wouldn't know. But we can exploit some of those characteristics that I showed earlier, in particular in this case, polarization, because the polarized sky is much, much, much more boring. So if we go from total intensity in this image to circular polarization, everything fades away. And we're left with three sources. So this one here is about is that really bright quasar that was shown before. About 0.1% of it leaks through. That's easy to rule out. This source there, that's actually Proxima Centauri, which is itself polarized. And then in this source here was a new source that we hadn't characterized before. So we focused in on that source, and we found that it was a pulsar. Steep spectrum, highly polarized source. We look at it with parks. We see pulsations. 2.7 milliseconds, moderately high DM. The thing that actually made it hard to identify from a traditional pulsar survey is the fact that it's not a very sharp peak. In those plots I showed you before, the pulsars were very narrow and sharp. That makes them easier to identify. They get lots of harmonics in the Fourier domain. These relatively slow, gradual ones can be a lot harder. So this was our first serendipitous pulsar discovery. We're now trying to do this more and more. Here's an image of the large Magellan cloud. Uh, Yuan Ming again filtered it for highly variable and or polarized sources and steep spectrum sources. And there was one object that met all of these criteria, bright in total intensity, but also detected in circular polarization. And then when we followed it up with the Meerkat telescope, we found again that it was a pulsar. This one I know is a pulsar. Now, again, this has a very sort of gradual, almost sinusoidal pulse profile. This source is actually the brightest pulsar in the Large Magellanic Cloud. People have been finding pulsars in the Large Magellanic Cloud since the 80s. But somehow they missed the brightest one because it wasn't like the pulsars they were looking for. This pulsar might even be the brightest pulsar ever, you know, brighter than all the ones in the Milky Way. We just don't know the distances in the Milky Way nearly as well. So once we were able to find it with Meerkat, we actually were able to go back to old data from 10, 20 years ago and see that it was in these surveys of the Large Magellanic Cloud. They just didn't rate it highly enough as a candidate. So we can use techniques like this to identify new regimes of pulsar space to go back and look at. And you know, if you're somebody like me, every pulsar is fun. You can also use them, of course, as you know, ways to understand galactic uh, supernova rates and you know, look for gravitational waves and all these other sorts of things. Then we're going to talk about a new galactic center radio transient. I, I talked about the first one a few minutes ago. So Andy Wang here, we did a survey of the center of the Milky Way, 
And you can see we're sort of combining several different fields of view into a single image here. And you know, Milky Way Center scads of interesting objects. I know you're looking at it with SPT as well. Lots of stuff at every conceivable wavelength. We wanted to identify interesting sources, so we concentrated on things that were either transient or polarized, or both. And if you can sort of tilt your head, the yellow circles are transients, the rings are polarized. And you see there's one object here that's both. So that's what we started with, that object right there. So this source, it's not right at the galactic center. It's located about four degrees away. But it's a very odd source. We don't really know of any real good analogs. It's about 25% polarized. The emission can be absent for months at a time. Flare, and then decay back in as fast as a day. We see nothing in other wavelengths. We've looked with Gemini in the infrared. We've looked with Chandra and X-rays. We see nothing even contemporaneously. We see no pulsations when we look with sensitive radio telescopes. And it seems that it's probably sort of nearby because we see that the linear polarization changes position angle. And from the linear polarization, you could tell through how much of the ionized Milky Way you're looking and the answer is not very much. Now, that's not a very solid argument, because if you have regions of magnetic field that change sign, that could still mimic this phenomenon. But the Faraday rotation toward this source isn't very high. So it might even be that it's nearby. And the fact that we're identifying it toward the galactic center is just because that's where we were looking. So provisionally, we're calling this a new galactic center radio transient which just means it's a new source that we don't understand that we found while looking toward the galactic center. It doesn't really help you understand what it is. Maybe they're a new class of object. Maybe this object is one of them. Or maybe just as you look in the Milky Way, you find a whole lot of new oddball sources. It looks it's four degrees from the galactic center, though. Yeah. The extinction is high even in the infrared. That's right. I think about, uh, I mean, it was sort of one hour with Gemini. You know, it, yeah, certainly. But that rules out something like a foreground flaring star. Because we see, again, you know, there's indications that it may be nearby. And the uh, radio emission seems coherent. You know, it has a brightness temperature of about 10 to the 12 Kelvin, uh, unless it's really close by. So you can rule out a nearby star. The other things would be like a more distant magnetar or something like that. Yeah, so, oh, sorry. So here's the radio light curve. You know, we didn't see it, we didn't see it. We saw it for a few weeks. Then, we, then it was fading down, and then we didn't see it again. And then it briefly flared up and faded back down over the time scale of a day. During that time, we were ready. We got some swift and Chandra observations, didn't see anything. Within each observation, we don't see any pulsations. Within each observation, we don't even see any scintillation or other indications of fast variability. So we need to look at these more. We need to understand, you know, are we only finding them because we're looking at the galactic center, or actually are they associated with something toward that line of sight at that distance? So as we expand into our full survey that I'll talk about soon, we should be able to figure that out. Okay, so those were, you know, four semi-deep dives into entirely different topics, just to overwhelm you even more. I'll just give you, you know, a few one-slide summaries of other things that some of our, our people are doing. Uh, you know, pulsars can vary for a wide variety of reasons. Here is one where we think we've identified a new pulsar in a binary system. So this pulsar is varying because it's eclipsed by material blown off of its binary companion, known as a black widow system. The radio source looks very, very pulsar-y, polarized, very steep spectrum associated with a Fermi gamma ray source. But despite looking with the Parkes telescope and Meerkat, we can't find any pulsations. So it looks like a pulsar, smells like a pulsar, but it doesn't seem to pulse. Is that because the pulses are being smeared out? 
by gas in the binary? Is that because the rotation and magnetic axes are too closely aligned? We don't really know. It seems to have a faint infrared counterpart, although it's next to this really bright star, so it's a little hard to get things like radio velocity observations to confirm that this is the counterpart. What we'd really like to do is figure out the orbit well enough that we could do a search for periodicities at gamma ray wavelengths. So far, that's computationally a little too hard. At the other end of the temperature spectrum, Covey Rose has identified a flaring T8 brown dwarf. So, brown dwarfs have been flaring at radio wavelengths, this has been known for a couple of decades. This is the latest type brown dwarf known to flare. Uh, it's at about 11 parsecs, so, you know, brown dwarfs are mostly nearby. This one is, is no surprise. Uh, and then, Covey did follow up with the, uh, the ATCA and identified a two-hour periodicity that we think is from the rotation of the brown dwarf. Uh, we don't know yet whether the flares are due to electro electron cyclotron maser, sort of like a star, or if it's more like aurora, like a planet. M dwarfs and brown dwarfs can sort of have both phenomena, and we're doing more detailed observations to try to figure that out. But one thing that's particularly interesting, I think, is that the luminosity that he finds for the source, even though it's you know the very latest type known, is entirely consistent with earlier type L and T brown dwarfs. So maybe the fact that these haven't been seen yet is just, again, because we haven't been looking systematically enough. And then another student, uh, James Lung, uh, he's been looking for orphan GRB afterglows. And again, orphan afterglow, you have a, a massive star that collapses. You get a relativistic jet that slams into the interstellar medium. And if you're looking from over here, you see a gamma ray burst, and you see a normal afterglow. Now, this is good, but what if you're looking from this direction? You only see this if you're along the line of this jet. If you're not, well, this jet will slow down once it hits the interstellar medium, and it will give rise to emission over a much wider area. That's known as an orphan afterglow, something where you don't see the gamma ray burst, you just see what it left behind. And we would really like to be able to find these and study them systematically to get an unbeaming dominated sample of gamma ray bursts. Now, this has been hard. People have been trying to do this for decades with radio surveys. It's hard because when you only have two or three epochs, identifying something that's an orphan gamma ray burst afterglow is challenging. All synchrotron transients look alike. <laughs> and when you have you know, three measurements, especially when they're years or decades later, it's hard to figure that out. Now, you know, again, there are some good examples coming out of like the VLA Sky Survey, but the numbers are small. What James is trying to do is exploit the fact that we have so many epochs of vast data, not just three or four, but 10, 20, that he can make a matched filter to identify orphan GRB-like events in the data. So you're not just looking for a variable source, you're looking for a source that has the right kind of variability. So he was able to identify uh, a couple of really good candidates in the data set. He's now been following it up with a compact array, and he has a paper in progress. Uh, you know, so far, this is still a candidate. It's hard to be certain about things like this yet, uh, but I, we think that once we have the full survey going, doing this sort of match filter analysis will be much better than just you know, looking for any variable source and saying, hey, are you an orphan afterglow? Are you an orphan afterglow? Are you an orphan afterglow? You know, you want to you know, make your search as efficient as possible. And then finally, another sort of semi-unexpected thing is looking at tidal disruption events. So this is when a star comes too close to a supermassive black hole. Some of the material falls into the black hole. About half of it is unbound and gives rise typically to a bright optical ultraviolet X-ray flare. And some good number of tidal disruption events are also seen at radio wavelengths. Uh, usually when this debris hits the surrounding gas, gives rise to a synchrotron afterglow like the one I was just talking about. Now, usually what happens with these TDEs is, you know, it'll go off, everybody will point their telescopes at it, they'll point the VLA at it. Once they see the radio come up, they'll monitor it as it fades away, and then they'll forget about it, they'll write their papers and move on to the next one. 
about a couple of years ago, Asaf Horesh and collaborators saw a couple of TDEs where they saw unexpectedly radio emission years later. And the reason for this is still not really well known. Maybe it's some of the material was you know, on a big elliptical orbit and made it back around. Maybe it's you know, secondary shocks or something like that. With VAST, we could actually do systematic searches for that behavior. You don't have to follow up the TDEs individually. You can look at all of them in a well-defined volume. So my student, Akash, here uh, did this together with Dougal. And they found six TDEs where they see late time flares. You, know, you can see up to 2,000 days later uh, that they're seeing here out of about 31 that were recorded in this time frame. So this is a pretty high rate, you know, 20% of the TDEs over this period had radio flares seen, you know, three to five years later. So as we're able, and this is for a relatively small area of the sky. So as we're able to expand this to not just get, you know, two point measurements, but get much better light curves and build up over time, we'll be able to study how prevalent this phenomenon is and try to figure out why it's going on. OK, so that was sort of a whirlwind through our initial VAST results. What are we doing in the future? Well, the full VAST survey started in December. And we're allocated for about 2,200 hours over the next five years. We've limited ourselves to some particular areas of the sky. Again, we're basically doing the full equatorial strip. You know, makes for better follow-up, makes for a lot of commensality with things like Stripe 82. We're doing big chunks of the high-latitude southern sky. And then we're doing the full southern galactic plane. The galactic plane we're doing about every two weeks. The rest of the sky we're doing about every two months. Plus, we have some deeper fields where we're drilling on them day after day for about a week. Plus, you know, thousands and thousands of hours of commensal access for all the other ASCAP projects we get access to to look for transients. We're not allowed to say find H1 galaxies, but if we find transients, it's fair game. So we're really just starting to mine this data. We've been going about yeah for about two months now. Uh, we're getting all of our you know infrastructure up and running. I'm happy to talk with people about that later. You know a lot of you know plans for pipelines and and things like that. We are looking to do real time or you know, within a day discovery and announcement if we find things. Um, you know, figuring out which ones are interesting is maybe a different question. And you know, you're welcome to join us. VAST is an open collaboration. Uh, send me an email, and you're welcome to join. You know, if you have any particular science interest along any of the questions that I've outlined, or any ones that you think might be well exploited by the VAST data, we'd love to have you on board. We do a lot of our computing at the Posi Regional Super at the Posi Supercomputing Center, so sort of like you folk here, but down in Australia, so with more dangerous spiders, uh, and then also the China SKA Regional Center. We've gotten some resources from them, but we have team members worldwide, uh, and Tara and I are the co-PIs, and then uh, Laura Dreesen and Dougal Doby are our project scientists who sort of keep a lot of things ticking over. So the VAST pilot survey has identified a number of interesting objects and is starting to probe statistically interesting samples. But it's really just the start. We also spent a lot of time developing pipelines and tools to speed up the detection, characterization, and cross-matching and all that. And we need to make sure that we worry about both identification of interesting sources and classification of interesting sources. You know. Majority of variable AGN are just not that interesting. And we need to make sure that we can put those to one side and focus on the most interesting objects. So the full VAST survey, which started late last year, should be really exciting. And we hope that it will pave the way for new endeavors like the Deep Synoptic Array and the Square Kilometer Array. Thank you. So I was curious about some of the TDE stuff that you had shown. Um, it looked like the, the ones that had those really bright late time detections might have been some of the more close by 
TDEs? Do you know if you'd expect, if you had like a larger, um, a deeper depth, that you would have found more than those six? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, my students working on that right now, trying to do some sort of rate estimates. Uh, that is his, uh, uh, well, that, that is his um, NASA finance proposal. So we'll see if that gets funded. Uh, but I mean, he'll probably do some of it anyway. But yeah, th those are the exact questions that we're trying to answer. Because we will have like this EMU survey that is, you know, an order of magnitude deeper. And that through various ways, we could try to do, you know, a multi-epic comparison to, to answer that exact question. Yeah, really nice talk. Thank you. Uh, you had a slide about four quasars flaring at the same time, and there's a stream. Uh, do you have any plan for follow-up of that and uh, confirming that stream, or is it already confirmed? Yeah, I mean, we've struggled to figure this out. Uh, I'm not an ISM expert, but the density, you know, we looked in every, you know, everything that Aladdin has to offer, we looked. Um, and the density and sort of contrast of that stream weren't such that we would expect any like H alpha emission or H1 emission. It's just, you know, it's, it seems to be kinematically isolated, but not enough to show up like in an image. So we're, we're seeing its presence, but we, oh, I mean, maybe if you have ideas, I'd love to hear them. But, you know, we did brainstorm about, you know, yeah, again, you know, H alpha, radio recombination lines, H1, you know, we see an emission, absorption. Uh, we couldn't come up with anything where we had, you know, a reasonable chance of doing it. I don't know, maybe like uh, plan for future such flares along the same line of sight, either ways, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. So we, we uh, you know, we have, uh, you know, we have sort of a, a fast imaging pipeline that we're working on to try to identify these things in real time. And then, yeah, the, there might be opportunities to, you know, look for other sources that are also scintillating, maybe to get a better map of the, of the, uh, the stuff going on. Yeah, when you say uh, real time for this, what kind of time scales are you talking about? Um, so we can, you know, if it takes 10 minutes to image, we can make, in, I mean, if it takes 10 minutes of observing, we can reduce in 10 minutes. Um, and then the question is, OK, you have sources. How much filtering do you need to do before you're prepared to release them? And you, know, you might have seen from LIGO, they went from, you know, we need to sit on our data for a month before we're convinced it's real, to we can issue an alert in 30 seconds. And so this will just take you know, learning about you know, what are the reasons for false positives? You know, can we characterize it well enough? So eventually, we hope to sort of do it in you know, you know, basically within the integration time. Yeah, sorry. One more question. You said like uh, AGNs are boring most of the time, <laughs> so I look at boring stuff as well. Uh, do you have any plans of publishing that or putting it on the on your site? Like yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, you know, we did we did publish all the statistics for the you know the variable AGN that we found. Um, it's just you know for the ones you know where it's you know a blazer or whatever we could say a little bit more, but for a lot of cases it's hard to tell whether it's intrinsic AGN variability or you know refractive scintillation. Um, but we are publishing all those catalogs as well. They just tend to, you know, come after the, you know, cherry picked results. So yeah, I, I am not my advisor. I don't mean to say that people who work on AGN are boring, uh, but uh, I'm just saying that, you know, it's, it's hard to, you know, when you have thousand variable sources, it's hard to know what to make of it individually. It's in a statistical sense though, I agree. It's very interesting. Thank you very much. How will the continuum depth of VAS compare to what ASCAP released? I forget from the wide survey. Yeah, so the RAC survey, the depth is about the same as one of our individual epochs. Uh, and so RACS has now done two passes of the sky at low frequencies, plus one pass at uh, higher frequencies. Um, EMU will be doing a deep survey of the entire sky at much greater depth. So, you know, RACS stands for the Rapid ASCAP Continuum Survey. So they're able to get it done in a couple months. EMU will take four years to do the same sky area, but instead of 10 minutes per pointing, they're doing 10 hours. So, you know, factor of 10 plus depth. Uh, any final questions? 
Uh, so just to, uh, actually on the AGN side, since we mentioned boring things, it would totally be cool to have changing look AGN with ASCAP. Yes, that is some, um, yeah. Uh, Christina Neeland is uh, um, part of the collaboration. Trying to, again, it can be challenging to identify those, but the TDEs that we turned out were part of that effort. Yeah. Uh, and on this pipeline, sure, I think this is all great, but I just wanted to stress, you know, we know where the LSSD deep drilling fields are, for example. Yeah. And looking at your sky map, it looks like things like LAs are well within your yeah. one day uh, one day cadence area. Um, so even if you don't get the alerts uh, filtered and cleaned enough, yeah. just put out everything in that region. It's not a big deal because we get uh, between six and twenty images every single night from LSSD in each filter in that region. So. There's subnight cadence to look for variability. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, while I'm here, uh, Tara Murphy's at a coordinated surveys of the Southern Sky meeting. Uh, you know, having some of those exact discussions. 